Jens Snowman is born in 1963 in Kiel, West Germany. Jens Snowman immigrated to Canada as a small child with his family in 1967, schooling in the English language, while his parents maintained a full German traditional household. You may explain to us what does it mean, German traditional household. Uh, Jens developed a passion for electronic circuit design and early age capitalizing on global radio communication system while developing a strong desire to explore the outer age of the globes following exposure to the wealth of knowledge rendered through soft short waves, short waves sorry, radio signals. At age 17, Jens lost the sight of his left eye due to an accident. Then, working as a land survivor in British Columbia, where he was closely working with a developing global positioning and electronic distance measurement equipment, still in its prototype stage. Following the shock of total eyesight loss after a second accident took his right eye, Gent was forced to quickly devise a plan of self-improvement to invite financial hardship generally associated with blindness. He immediately engaged in, a, in building his own employment opportunity through small businesses, allowing him to successfully raise eight children and also invest in his own solar energy company, Green First Technologies, which presents operates in both Canada and Namibia. In 2002, following the development of various innovative methods of operating a farm despite vision loss, Jen was invited, to, invited by a renegade brain computer researchers, Dr. Dolbel. He will explain in detail what's the, the, the purpose of, of this as the first patient to restore sight artificial visions funneled through a video camera. Jens work as both test patient and research collaborator for Dobel Institute, which implanted 16 patients with similar technology before its demise at the end of 2004. As Dr. Dolabel passed away prior to publishing papers on his finding during the implementation of the research project, Jens authored his book, Search for Paradise, a patient's account of the artificial vision experiment. In 2012, which has since inspired Netherlands Institute of Neurology to engage in a similar but more advanced system of cortical stimulation, engaging Jens as a consultant to date. Then, in 2010, Jens moved his family to Namibia, where he is presently heading a primary grade boarding school, as well as he has acting as solar system consultant. Please welcome Jens Noman. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today. My absolute pleasure because it is only the second day after the 1st of January. And despite the festive season, you all made this effort to come out and see, I figured, just me. And I think that's progress on its own right there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As you heard from Professor Xavier's introduction, I was involved in a initiative to connect a computer to my brain to restore eyesight. And I am going to explain this process to the point where we can then afterwards reverse engineer this process and see how creativity was involved and what we might have learned from it. So if you look at slide number one, if we do have slide number one up, that is, as um, Professor Xavier said, the cover of my book. And the important, very important point about this book is that when this project had completed, there was no record of it. The patients moved on. The person who was heading this, Dr. William H. Dobell, he passed away at the end of 2004. And the university that inherited the project from his widow simply put it on the shelf and we didn't hear more of it. So I figured it would be a shame to have all of this information just disappear. Because after all, 
creativity and progress goes as far as the textbooks that are written, right? I mean, if you open your textbook right now and you are reading, you're an engineer, you're learning about Ohm's law, if somebody who discovered all of these creative new theories and concepts didn't write them down for you to profit from them, you would have to reinvent them all over again. So it is not only your responsibility to think in a creative way, but if there is a creative moment for you to record it and make sure that this can be used as a stepping stone, as a milestone for future, for future geniuses to take over. If not, they will have to retrace the same path over and over again, and we will, of course, not get anywhere if we walk up and down the same aisle. Having said this, let's look at creativity in general. Creativity is this movement of being able to look beyond what is written in the textbook. Imagine that. Our pedagogy, up to this point, has been concentrating on what is written in a textbook. Yes, we are looking at the creativity of yesterday. And we must know it, because that is how we develop our industry-specific logic. When Dr. Dobell started this process of implanting people in their brains to attempt to see again, he had to use logic that was based on other technologies because nobody has done this before. So this new logic, he was not able to evolve this new logic into a, into a more advanced state until he actually went through the active experimentation part of this. And then the reflective observation and eventually you develop a new set of logic. But we'll get back to this. We as leaders, future leaders of organizations, have a responsibility to understand creativity and not be afraid of it. I know it sounds scary to think that it is very important to know what is not written in a textbook. We always say, but, but nobody approved it yet. Nobody says it's correct. There isn't Dr. So-and-so's name behind it saying, yes, this is true. And there is not an FDA, for instance, saying, yes, this is safe. There's not a government organization saying, yes, this is the right thing to do. But that would be analogous to the Wright brothers who invented the airplane saying, well, we don't know where to get a pilot's license from, so we can't yet uh, test our new machine. How is that going to work? We will never invent the airplane if we don't expect the MTO to first put out a pilot's license, but the Ministry of Transportation can't do that until there is an invention that warrants a pilot's license. So we are going to be stuck if we only think as far as our textbooks allow us to. But don't throw away those textbooks, you'll still need them. I will be speaking about the project, then I will reverse engineer and see what we've learned, and then I will have questions and answers, and I expect that everybody has an answer, a question for me afterwards, because this is a very deep process of uh, implanting a person's brain so that they can see, because not only does it conjure up feelings of, yay, we've, we've won something, we are progressing, but there's also a lot of fear involved in this. A lot of social fear that, I mean, we see these humanoid movies, these zombie movies, and all those things. They are a reflection. They are not just for entertainment. They actually mean something, because it means that we are afraid of this as a society. And as we are making more progress into um, BCIs, the brain, community, brain com computer implant culture, we are also becoming increasingly weary of what this might end up. I mean, and why can't we? For instance, it's per perfectly justified to be afraid of technology in a way when we see what happened with the nuclear technology. It can be used for our benefit, but it can also be used to completely destroy humanity from the Earth. And we are presently at a political crisis sometimes in this world where we have to think about that over and over again, and it is not good. So, progress. We know that the theme is how far can progress lead us? Before we can answer that, we have to say, what is progress? What does progress mean to each and every one of us? Just like beauty is the eye in the eye of the beholder, we can say progress is in the mind of the innovator. So progress can mean something for me that it doesn't mean for you. It can mean something for you that I really don't care about. Progress is usually, you know, typical examples of progress in the past would be the invention of the automobile. 
And then we can say, for instance, the invention of peace. If we, if we have a better idea of how we can have a more peaceful nation or a more peaceful world in general, that would apply to a lot of us. And then we could also have, how can we eliminate marginalized sector populations? One of them being people with disabilities. Will that be progress? Because the second part of that question is us. How far can progress lead us? Who is us? Are we naively thinking it might be 7.3 billion out of 7.3 billion? That for every step in progress, everybody's going to win? Let's look at some of the past, uh, some of the past experiences with progress. The invention of the automobile. It used to be that there were horses and buggies all over the place, and a, a child as young as 12 years old could go into town at their free will and uh, do whatever they needed to do and help the family. And then you also had uh, people, they could party and drink and go home, and the horses, they wouldn't collide with one another. They just kind of found their way home, and you just hung on. That's all you had to do. Well, in the meantime, we have the automobile. It started out being just for the elite, because it was a few thousand dollars to produce one in 1900s, the early 1900s. Then, thanks to uh, Henry Ford, we had the assembly line. The assembly line, pr the production line, allowed us to have cars for $495 a piece, the, the Model T. Now, the working class could afford it, but along with that came the licenses and then we had the, the, the people left out. They had some people left out. For instance, if I'm in Africa now, I don't see everybody there with a car. And uh, when I think about the, the youngsters now, it used to be when I was young, when I was 16, I could get my learner's license in Canada for $10. And I would drive dad's car for about three months. And after that, I could do my full dri driver's license. And that was it. Now, we have the graduated licenses for two years. We have pro prohibitively high insurance rates for the young people. And if I ask right now, even without being able to see you, how many of you own your own automobile here, I'm not going to see a full set of hands. So what does that mean? Some people are left out of progress. But now, suppose progress means being able to see again. Most of you can see already. The mainstream can see. So what? What does that change for you? For me, it means the world. And this progress is only progress Whatever it is, whether it's the invention of the car, whether it's the invention of a new way of being able to see for the blind, if it stays in place. For instance, right now we see that the automobile is causing some problems with our climate. Well, what do we do in the meantime? Do we step back and say, let's use horse and buggy and just wait until we find a solution to this? No. We continue to drive the car. We make modifications that we can. We switch to the hybrid and a little bit more um, energy efficient cars, smaller engines, etc. But in the meantime, we're still using the internal combustion engine, pumping in the carbon dioxide until we have a solution. And we are finding solutions. The electric car, like the Tesla, etc., the Chevy Volt, they are out there and they are making their debut. And they are looking like they're going to be successful. Now we just have to have the rest of us think that no, we don't need to have a V8 under the hood. We can have an electric motor under the hood and we are still tough men. So, you know, we, we have a few things to worry about when it comes to social change and the time that it, that it takes to implement this change. But we did not step backwards in progress yet with what happened to me is I was able to see perfectly well in 2002, 2003 using the system of Dobell's. And then in 2004, when this company no longer existed, I had to step back into the blind world. And to date, as you see, I walked up here with a white cane. I didn't walk up here looking at you what went wrong. So let's look at this. So let's start out with frame number two, OK? Frame number two is me with a, um, an implant in my head. You can see this electrical outlet sticking out of the top of my head. And I put a little bit of, uh, I put a little bit of technical knowledge there with it so that you could, uh, you could read it. And I'm glad I did because now I realize that we, we have a few engineering students in here that, that come here as well to do business administration, which, which is great. So just to quickly read it out there, this is... Uh, this is a jack that was made by Dr. Dobell. It wasn't uh, particularly 
a medical device at the time, and it is not medically uh, approved titanium, and so it was doing a little bit of infecting around the corners, but then the inside of it is an IT&T jack, 72 pin compression fit. I don't think IT&T expected them to be used for medical devices, but uh, it's an inline cable connector you're supposed to use just wherever, but uh, in this case we use it as a medical device. And that connects to the conductors, 36 gauge steel, um, stainless steel, 316 um, LM stainless steel, so that's uh, medical grade or as close as you can get for stainless steel. Going into electrodes, so it goes through the skull, and then there's this this big thick skin that's called the dura covering your brain and that is opened up by the surgeon and these electrodes are stuck in where the visual cortex is and the visual cortex kind of is almost looks like um, like there's a crack there at the back and you have to go on either sides of those cracks for the left and right visual primary visual cortex and so these electrodes they just sit on there they're not stuck in the brain thank goodness these ones here anyways um, they are just laying on top they're little circles of platinum on a substrate, like a, a piece of plastic, and this plastic is celastic material, which is also a, an approved um, implantable material. This is uh, an operation, and now I'm, because we see this, let's go to what actually happened to me and why I got to this point. Okay, so in I went, at the age of 20 years old, I lost my second eye. It was an unexpected accident. Uh, something penetrated my right eye. My left eye already had a similar accident from a different activity. And my retinas on both sides were totally destroyed. So no retinas, not even the second, third, fourth, fifth layer. It was all destroyed. And along it with the optic um, canal was also destroyed. So in other words, I had no chance of seeing again using my eyes. I had to make provisions quickly, 20 years old, I lost my work, everything, because you see the two things happen when you lose your eyesight. The first thing is you're not sure what to do anymore because most of the things you're used to doing, you do in the light. We use artificial light now, so we don't even have our skills that are put into us from nature to be able to operate as a, um, yeah, in, the, in the total dark. I mean, animals, for instance, they have to work in total dark because we only have 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of night. So we are hardwired to be able to deal with, with the dark. So it's highly rehabilitational, provided you have the right real rehabilitational stimulus and the mindset, you can actually do almost everything in the dark as you can in the light. So I started my own businesses, I, I did my renewable energy, I could still work with wires, I could still work with transistors, I could even solder. So I, I actually had, a, I could move forward. I even delivered six of my last eight of my eight children um, because we were doing the home births at the time. So it was, it was a very exciting time, I was able to rehabilitate, but the one problem was I was still doing this in the dark. Regardless of my children coming home to visit, etc., they are still just a voice in the dark. And this will not change. And even if you see me right now in the same environment that you are in, for me it is just dark. Your voice is in the dark, and uh, I remember seeing a movie when I was a child called Now You See Him, Now You Don't. It was just a comedy about somebody being sprayed with a certain chemical and they would be invisible. What havoc they could create being invisible. Well, to me, you are all invisible. So just to let you know, you are invisible. But I can still tell if you're looking at your cell phone instead of paying attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> so, I wanted a change from that because I had built up a nice life. I had a farm, I had, you know, I, I was luckily not in the marginalized sector when it came to uh, the economic side because I decided to break away from that cycle. So I didn't really fit that well into the blind community. I didn't fit well into the sighted community. I was sort of in a community of my own, like a little rebel there, whatever you want to say, but at least I was having fun. Now I wanted to see again and I was able to afford this system which was something that was actually very important to point out because when I came to Dobell, I expected to have a, uh, you know, a, a, a waiting list of maybe six, seven, eight, ten years to be able to get this implant. But luckily, I was able to get in first. And 
1993, three years after I lost my, t or 10 years after I'd completely lost my sight, I went to the best retinal surgeon in the world. Uh, well, in, in Canada, it was Dr. Michael Shea, but he was in contact with all other retinal surgeons across the globe. And he says, Jens, you can, you can go around the world as often as you want, you will never see again. Okay, well, I was supposed to make peace with blindness, and that's exactly what he told me, but I couldn't do that. I was still interested in seeing the world. And I thought there was something that could be done, because I, I had knowledge of Dr. Giles Brindley, Giles Brindley, from 1968. He was a, a, a United Kingdom doctor who was operating on conscious patients to, re to reduce the, uh, or, or to find epileptic um, lesions on the back of their brains in the area of the visual cortex. So he had the brain uh, uncovered, a part of the skull taken out, and he was looking for them, but he, was, he made sure that the patients were conscious, so it was under local anesthesia. And when he was touching physically with a probe, the part of the brain that sees the visual cortex, the patient says, no, I actually see dots of light when you do that. So he recorded that. He experimented a bit and recorded that they would see dots of light in different places. Um, congruent with how he moved the probe. So if he moved the probe and it was right at dead center vision and he moved a little over to the one side, then the patient would see it move to one side of the visual field. So he made notes of this and because of these notes, yes, because he recorded his creative moment, Dr. Dobell, 10 years later, started to work on this same project. In the year 2000, I was going through the internet using uh, my, my newfound voice system. It was a very nice invention for me to be able to read with a computer again using the uh, screen reader technology. And I came across Dr. Dobell's site, artificialvision.com. Very interesting. He had worked since 1978 on this principle, using some volunteers just to test for biocompatibility and proof of concept, to see whether or not this uh, was viable, what Dr. Giles Brindley had started, except now, unlike Dr. Giles Brindley, Dobell had access to the evolving computer industry. At that time, in 1978, you would buy the Apple II. You had to uh, manually load it with um, the QBasic uh, language, and then you could do some simple tasks with your Apple computer, and they were very expensive. But as time continued, by the time we hit year 2000, the Pentium processor came out. And the Pentium processor had 166 megabits of processing power per second. So that's quite a bit to be able to run an artificial vision system that has to change frames a certain number of times per second, preferably 24, but we managed to get it up to seven. And also to be able to run the system through a, uh, a series of filters so you would have edge detection. So what happened is I met up with Dr. B William Dobell from the United States because he was looking for test implant patients for clinical implantation. So what he wanted to do was give every patient that applied 70 electrodes per side, so 70 on the left and 70 on the right of the visual field. The volunteers he had done up to this point were six. Three of them were permanently implanted and three were implanted temporarily for a few weeks using a Penrose drain to exit the wires from the head just to see whether or not they would see light sensations and at what age, because he had to use a wide variety of different age implantations, we found out that we couldn't provoke light sensations if the patient lost their sight when they were too young. For instance, one of the patients he had implanted was six years old when he lost his sight implanted him as an adult and he could not see the sensations. So, but I was fine, I had lost my scent when I was 20 and Dr. Dobell reassured me I would be a fine patient for this new bilateral implant of which I would be the first. So I was wondering, why am I the first? Well, Dr. Dobell held a few thousand in email inquiries. They were, all interest, they were all interested in getting their implantations. But by the time that my implantation happened in year 2002, I was one of eight patients. I was very excited about this. Dr. Dobell said that I would probably be able to recognize faces. So, I mean, if you can recognize faces, that's, that's major. 
I mean, I was so excited about this. I started to dream in the, the phosphine vision. And the idea of this technology was that these 140 electrodes implanted in my brain would then each get an assigned voltage of, alterna of alternating um, current because each one would be different. It's called a threshold. Right at the point where you start seeing the, f the, the light sensation, wherever it might be in my visual field, it's called the threshold. So that would be recorded, and the computer, would, uh, the computer program would remember it. So if electrode 1 used 2.5 volts, that one would always get 2.5 volts. If electrode 2 needed 3.6 volts, it would always get 3.6 volts. Because if you went too far over the threshold, you could conjure seizures in the patient, and the patient would go down, and, and, it, and it would be very, very unpleasant. In fact, that happened to me twice, and it was extremely unpleasant. Um, but that's part of innovation and creativity, I suppose. So when it was my turn for an implantation, I asked Dr. Dobell then a few more details about what was going to happen, and he, he gave me the computer equipment to look at. And uh, if we go to the next slide, slide number three, you'll see me there wearing the system. So uh, that's uh, it, it, it looked, you know, that. It, it wasn't quite the right timing for that system because this was 2002 April and September 2001 we had those um, Twin Tower bombings and this was all happening in New York City except for the implantation but when I came back that's how I looked and uh, some people were very threatened by my look so I, I, had to, I had to wear a lot of clothes which uh, were sometimes very warm but it was worth it. In fact, once Dr. Dobell, he was so far out of it when it came to human sociology. He was a very strong engineer, but human sociology wasn't his, his strong point. And he says to me, no, Jens, I want you to wear that system going on the plane at, to JFK, J, uh, you know, the Kennedy International Airport. And uh, luckily, <coughs> and he says, no, it's a visual prosthesis. And uh, it was only as his chauffeur, who was a retired policeman, who says, Bill, they're going to shoot him on sight. Better not. <laughs> But it worked. Regardless of how it looks, it worked. When I had my first interview with one of Dobell's workers, he asked me, so how far are you willing to go with how you look? I said, well, I'm willing to walk around with a fridge on my back, provided I can see with it. So uh, this isn't quite a fridge on my back, but uh, we, we didn't know the events that, that would lead up to this. If, it, if we didn't have that crisis in 2001, September 11th, I think uh, it, this wouldn't have been so much of a problem. Nonetheless, I had the implantations, and uh, so did seven other people. And the, the initial reaction from Dr. Dobell was that, uh, well, he, 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 he was wondering why I was feeling so ill. He said, we did the volunteers with just a single implant of 68 electrodes, and it was just day surgery for them. They were basically done under local anesthetic, and then that night they were already out of the hospital. And I did speak with one of them, Dr. not Dr. Um, Jerry T. Tehan, who was the last patient to be implanted on the volunteer basis in 1978. And he says, no, it wasn't a big deal for him. But when we did the two implants, it was a completely different story. We were down and out for a week. And the headache, I don't think there are words in the English language to describe the headache, but they were, they were severe. Uh, but I did recover. After about four weeks, I could go back to work. So the idea was then, six weeks later, I would go down to the Dobell Institute in New York, and we would fit me with one of those uh, electronic devices to look just like you see in, number, um, in, in frame number three, where we are now. I come down, and to my surprise, it's a very small office. There aren't very many people working there. I thought it would be very busy and there would be hundreds of people and researchers, but Bill said, no, Dr. Dobell. He said, uh, we are funding this ourselves. Now, I had to pay $100,000 for this, so it wasn't so much ourselves, but that $100,000 just barely scratched the surface of what we had to do. The Dobell Institute was at the moment, working together with Avery Labs, it was under the same name, but a different corporation. And Avery Labs was producing other medical devices. One was an FDA-approved breathing pacemaker, which to date is being um, produced in order to help people who are quadriplegic be able to breathe without a respirator. It's FDA-approved, so they've been selling this, and as a result of the sales, they've been funding 
this project. Dr. Nobel just used that money to keep funding this project and the research for it because it was an expensive project. We were actually supposed to do the implantations not only in Portugal where I went because that it was a lot cheaper there and uh, in, in American doctors weren't ready to do something that wasn't FDA approved, but also we were supposed to fly everybody to Portugal every time we did the testing. But sometimes we just couldn't do that, so we had to kind of devise a place where we could do the testing without attracting too much attention. Um, in the end, I was able to see from those 140 implanted electrodes, I was able to see 96 points of light. So now let's go to slide number four. Slide number four shows you what we hoped we would see. There's a cute little grid of 12 by 12 phosphenes. And those phosphenes, they are the light sensations you're supposed to see when you get electric current, alternating current put to your visual cortex. You see little um, dots of light forming like that. And so that, that's what makes a picture. So up to 19 of those would be used at a time per frame in order to make a frame. And if we could have had a phosphine map like, map like that, maybe it would have worked. But we were using the logic that was based on the, the kind of the design that we're doing right now in the, the design techniques we have in pixelated cameras, in sports scoreboards, etc. Even the television screen you're looking at right now. You have an even grid of pixels. You pick out the ones you want, and there's your picture, voila. That's how we expected the visual cortex to work. Now, my implant looks like number five. After we did the thresholding to see where I see the phosphines, if we look at number five, frame number five, that's what I saw. So it was completely different, as you can see. Quadrant number one. So now this is your visual field, okay? This is kind of the visual field. The divider goes down the middle on a vertical line. So right down the middle, like between one and two, three and four, that line, that is the left and right visual cortex. So if I only had one implant, I would only see whatever's on the left or whatever's on the right, depending on which one we use. Now we're cross-wired in the head, so if we stimulate the left visual cortex, the left side of the brain, we're actually seeing it on the right side of our visual field and vice versa. So this is what we saw. You see nothing in number one. Number three has a big cluster, kind of messy. And then number four it, and uh, two and four, it goes all over the place. So why is number three like that? Because what happened was the wires, 36 gauge, 72 of them, that, that, that's awkward. It's actually a mess of wires, and it's a thick cable. It's almost the size of a pencil, if you want to imagine that, you engineers. Uh, you can kind of appreciate that. 36 gauge wire is good for 130 milliamperes. We didn't need it that thick, but Bill Dobell thought so. Uh, because we were maybe going to put one or two or 10 milliamperes at the most to it. We could have used 46 gauge or 48 gauge, but Bill Dobell insisted on the 36 gauge, so when they when the neurologists try to put that in, and these people aren't used to working with wires, they're used to working with brains and scalpels. So when they were putting this in, they were having real problems routing the wire into the different crevices and that and getting it properly out of the dura that ultimately where they put that implant, it shifted. And after it shifted, they already had everything sewn up. They couldn't really do a lot about it. So it was not in the right place on my visual cortex, but luckily it was still on the visual cortex. We had one patient shift so much that it didn't even show up on their cortex anymore and uh, they were only able to use one side. That was just part of the problem of these implants. And uh, it, it, it could be resolved by a second surgery, but these surgeries were were pretty dramatic, so I didn't want to have another one. So I decided, let's just go with it, that's the way it is. And Bill Dobell said, well, you'll probably have reduced vision as a result, but I said, well, let's see. Okay, so we see, because we were still operating on a logic that we assumed, an assumed logic, right? And I'm going to talk about assumed logic soon, because that's a big problem with creativity, is when you assume too much logic. Then, we started to do the connection of the camera. Now, after you have these in place, you right now, when you're looking at the screen, you can say, you can direct your eyes here, and then you can direct it there, and then direct it there, and say, okay, this is what I see there, 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 just like you can on a television screen. Well, you can't do that when you have phosphine vision, because whatever you see in the center stays in the center. 
Whatever you see to, you see to the left stays to the left. You try to move your eyes, it'll move to the left with it. It's kind of like you right now, if you look at the lights or some, uh, a, a picture, you know, look at it nice, close your eyes tight, and then move your eyes around, you're going to see that picture kind of etched in your retina for a few seconds, move around with it. You can't just look and look the picture over with your center of vision moving from one side of the picture to the other. You can't. And that's the way it was with me, too. And this is what made it very hard to work with patients after that, because now the patient not only had to tell us when they start seeing the light, but they had to also tell us where exactly they saw it. And you can't. Anything you see a little bit away from the center of your vision where your fovea is, maybe one, one or two degrees, it becomes difficult to see if it's five centimeters at arm's length, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters. You can't really tell. But it was necessary to know in order to make a good picture because each one of these pixels that we could see, these phosphines, we had to align perfectly with a pixel block we picked out of the camera. So the very dead center of the camera that was worn on our face, we had to coincide with a very dead center pixel we saw in our visual field. If we saw one 30 centimeters over, that would be maybe six degrees or something at arm's length, we had to make sure we had one at six degrees from center of vision exactly on the camera. If not, we would see a very contorted picture. In fact, what would happen then is when you scan something from the left to the right, it would appear to be moving in the wrong direction if you had pixels misplaced. So with some patients, it was very easy to work with them, and we could set them up within two weeks. And others, even after four weeks, we were struggling because they would just say, no, we see that one in front of our nose. No, we see that one in front of our nose. But it wasn't in front of our nose. It was in a specific place but it wasn't there for tests to be able to tell us exactly where to see it. They had different, different strengths, and one of them wasn't to be very analytical on this. So we had, we had very big challenges setting these up for some of the patients, and some other patients were able to, to, to really prosper from this and use the system. So out of the 16 implanted patients, we uh, had eight of them being able to use the system nicely, and we had the others, they had problems with it for one reason or another. One of the patients was three years old when he lost his sight. His parents, um, despite our warning saying that he probably won't see the phosphines, he was 14 years old now when he was implanted, and his parents said, no, we, we want to try, we really want our son to see. And uh, in the end, he was not able to see the phosphines anyways, but he was, he was our only patient that couldn't see the phosphines. Everybody else could. So by the time the patient was completely set up, and I was the first one, we expected it to work perfectly fine. So we expected that moment to throw the switch, see the rubbish bin over in the corner, walk over there, throw a white cane in there, and that's the end of blindness. But it didn't happen like that. When it was turned on, all I saw was a mess. Instead of seeing the little nice frames being put together. I saw just flashes of irritating light. Mind you, the light was nice to see in comparison to being in the dark. But I wasn't able to see anything, really. So Dr. Dobell says, mm -mm, watch this. And in front of the Wired magazine, uh, Stephen Kotler, reporter at the time, his name was Stephen Kotler, he was invited to put me on the Wired magazine on the t September of 2002 issue. So if you buy that issue, or you can even see that still on the internet, I'm there with my head um, and, and driving a car and everything. And so he, he said, OK, let's clear the table off. I was sitting at a conference room table. He clears the table off. I see nothing. Then he throws the telephone in front of me, and I see flashes of light. And he says, do you see that? I say, yeah, I see the light. And he says, see? He says to the reporter, blind man sees telephone. Well, it didn't look like a telephone to me. It just kind of looked like a mess. So I was a little discouraged. And I was discouraged for a number of days because he said, well, this is what you've got. And I actually phoned my wife at the time and said, I, I, I think I kind of wasted my money. So when you think about what I invested in, this was a project that was unlike a normal financial model project. We normally, for instance, if we're developing a new product, et cetera, we're putting in the money, but we're able to sell another project equivalent to that, so we already have a client base, and while we're putting the money in, we also have other investors who invest in the stock market and who have high confidence in our work, et cetera, and then eventually, when it is proven, when it's out there, then the end user client comes back and returns the investment. Well, in this case, we didn't have that luxury. 
because it wasn't approved yet. So there was nobody that wanted to invest except the end user who was a desperate bunch of blind people and they put their $100,000 down <clears throat> and hoped it would work. So we were not only the end user client, but we were also the ones taking the biggest risk because this could have gone a number of different ways. We could have paid our 100,000 and nothing happens. We could have paid our 100,000 and then had a serious injury as a result, an additional disability or even death, such as lack, last, lack of cognition, major brain hemorrhage, etc. Or there was that final thing. We could have been able to see perfectly well only to see the company fall down a few years later and return to blindness. That's where progress, if progress isn't on a f solid stepping ground, I don't know if we can call it progress or if we can call it pending progress. Nonetheless, <clears throat> just after I was able to see the telephone, just flashes of light on the table, I decided to use the system just to walk around the Dobell office, which was a fairly large place, about a thousand square meters, and uh, avoid furniture, walk through doorways, etc. And just by using the way my, my head moves, because I couldn't use the movement of my eyes, I had to use the movement of my head, which controlled the camera location. And so if I went like this and this and this, you would see that, okay, I'm looking at a door frame. Uh, that, that's kind of how I did, oh, there's a chair because it's a flashing light. Now somewhere around three days after using the system, I could tell when I moved my arm from this side to this side, Oh, that's my arm and it's moving. So it was starting to, 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 to my, my brain was starting to adjust to, to this system to the point where I was able to distinguish my left from my right. Within two days, I was able to tell where my white cane was. I'd lost my white cane and it was standing against a wall on the other side of a room. I was able to see it. And that's when I had the breakthrough moment. Wow, this actually works. From there on, my sight increased in leaps and bounds. Yes, it was only up to 19 phosphines we were using, but for some reason, rather than what we had initially thought that this would be a, a bad phosphine map, we were making new discoveries. So if you look at number, um, the frame number six, yes, number six. See, now this is the letter, capital letter H, and you see there's a lot of bytes out of it. And this is if you're looking at a single frame. So that's a single frame using the phosphine map I had. Yes, it would have been nicer if I had had the, the perfect grid from number four, screen number four. But we had screen number five grid, so we had get screen number six, which is the H, and it doesn't look nice. But something we discovered quite by accident was that there's this working memory in your visual cortex that overlays a number of frames very quickly. It's about a, between a, a, a second and two seconds. In fact, this is already, there's a paper written on it by, the, by NIN that's, that, um, that uh, verifies this. And this working memory is putting together additional frames. So if you look at now frame number seven, that is how I actually saw the H. And look, there isn't even that missing spot anymore. Why? Because I'm moving my head in a strategic way in order to put seven frames a second together. And by the time I have the 10th frame at about a second and a half, that's the picture I get. In addition to this, I was able to see small details, smaller details because if, if, you know, back to frame number five where you see those clusters being so close together, there aren't those spaces in between the frames, in, in between the phosphines in some strategic places. So for instance, when I had a coffee cup on the table in front of me, I could spin the coffee cup, look away from it and look at it again without feeling and I could tell which way the handle was. So the acuity there was actually enhanced as a result of having that messy type irregular grid. Hence, after um, number 13 was implanted, patient number 13 was inf implanted, Dr. Dobell implanted um, three patients with the bigger system because he wanted to develop a system that was at 484 electrodes instead. And this time, his system, uh, didn't have that neat phosphine grid on the, uh, on the electrode arrays. He actually made them in an irregular pattern so that he would be guaranteed to have some sort of an irregular pattern when it was um, portrayed as phosphines to the patient in their visual field. 
So that's where, yes, our logic changed. It evolved. Then I was able to walk better. I was able to see buildings outside. I was able to see the outlines of the roofs, for instance, if it was an A-frame roof or if it was a flat roof. It was in the industrial subdivision of Comac, New York, that I was walking with my son at the time. And then I was able to see my white cane. And I stopped using my white cane because my white cane would always appear back and forth and back and forth in front of me. It was almost a distraction. I was able to see the ends of my feet as I walked. It was amazing. I haven't seen the ends of my feet for 18 years at that point. So it was a new feeling. I was able to walk at times without using the cane if I was in an in a, in a area where I didn't have to worry about traffic, etc. And it, it was actually a, a brand new feeling. It was a feeling as if I was back to 20 years old. I expected this to remain part of my life forever. I wasn't ready to throw the white cane in the garbage, but I was ready to embrace this new sighted life. I could see my children now for the first time. It wasn't like the way that you would imagine seeing your children now, but I was able to see enough. When I was sitting at the table and I could see the eight of them sitting around it, I could see the smaller ones, for instance, had certain traits. They would bring their head more down towards their spoon instead of the spoon up to their, their, their mouth. And, you know, just, just the way they, they acted, I was able to pick that up. So there was a quality of life improvement that was amazing just from these few phosphines and from this renegade doctor who was still working against the will of the FDA in doing these implants. Needless to say, I was ready to kiss blindness goodbye. I was part of the research team. I'd been hired with Dr. Dobell at the time um, because of my language skills and my multidisciplinary knowledge. How did I get multidisciplinary knowledge? Well, after I lost my eyesight, I realized one of the biggest problems of blindness is you are marginalized. Regardless of what skills you have, people question whether or not they really want you in the workforce. Now, some of this has changed in some countries, but in most countries it hasn't yet. We have good services, but we don't have that part yet installed because we do have lawsuits, liabilities, etc. And sometimes you go and ask for a job as a social worker, and despite having all the skills and blindness not playing a role in it, they'll say, well, suppose there is a fire in the building and you have to take one last look around to see if somebody's maybe still in the room, another patient, you will not be able to do that so we know we can't hire you would be liable so unless you have a very strong social program then uh, it, it isn't possible to get a job however if you are in your private enterprise it's the product that counts the client wants the product regardless of how it comes to fruition so that's what I did so I incorporated this into my my everyday work but I didn't need it what I did need was the fact that I was able to see with this. And, but as a result of, of my, um, my need to be able to work in different disciplines, for instance, I started out as a piano technician and then I had to move to a different one because acoustic pianos became obsolete. And then I went into the renewable energy where I designed my own electronic products. And from there on, I was also working in the agriculture industry because it, indus it, it was, was very interesting. And then later I got a degree as a social worker. So I worked in different fields so that I would be able to at least qualify for one of them somewhere. And in the end, I'm still using these, these different disciplines in order to be able to get even my own work under control. But because I had these disciplines, I was able to look at what Dr. Robel had to offer, and I wasn't afraid of it. So the, the fear that can be in, in one of us, we've heard of the expression fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown is when there's something in a box and you don't know what it is. It could be something that can hurt you. It could be something that can reward you, but you are, you are afraid of it. If there's a discipline you know nothing about, it is high time you educate yourself. At least get what's called transdiscipline literacy, compressed in a way that you can understand some of the key words and the key concepts that engulf this discipline so you don't have to be afraid of it anymore. I mean, think about, for instance, the self-driving car right now, the auto autonomy level three car. Some of us who understand computers well 
and systems of observation such as the GPS, the cameras, redundancy built in in order to protect you against the blue screen of death that might run the car off the road, things like that. We know these things exist, but we also know that there are solutions in order to avoid that there's a catastrophe. But for us that don't know anything about computers except sometimes use them in order to play games and then see this blue screen of death, we say, uh-uh, I don't want that. Next thing you know, we, we, we're in a bus and we see the blue screen of death and that's the end of us. So what you don't know can, can do one of two different things in a discipline. It can either give you unrealistic expectations of that discipline, whereby you might say, oh, you know, this desk is too low, let's hook a computer to it and it's going to be better. Uh, you know, and that, that kind of, a, a, that kind of um, as funny as it sounds, that kind of mentality does exist. For instance, when I lost my eyesight first, people were saying, no, no, you can get a pig's eye. You can just get an eye implant and all that. And I say, no, no, you can't. I mean, after I lost my first eye, I learned a lot about eyes. And I realized that, that was it if I ever lost my eye, right eye because there was no such thing as implanting an eye. An eye implant really just means that you're taking the cornea of an existing eye and you're putting it onto yours, and the cornea is just that invisible, that, that transparent skin that's at the front of your eye. It's not a big project, it's just skin. So that can be transplanted, yes. You can transplant the lens, yes. It is again just a piece of tissue. But you cannot transplant the retina that is part of your brain, it has the ganglion cells, everything in it. So there's absolutely no way to transplant that, but people were saying, no, you can get a pig's eye. And so I'd be walking blind down the street with my stick and they'd say, what's going on? Get that pig's eye. So then people were thinking I was voluntarily expecting living blind because there was this pig's eye out there. So sometimes when you don't know a discipline at all, you have unrealistic expectations, or you don't know its potential. And there's another problem. If you don't know what a computer can actually do, then it will never cross your mind to use a computer in order, or any sort of electronic means, in order to enhance a product. If you don't know, for instance, what the potential is of neuroplasticity, it's a big deal these days, neuroplasticity. In fact, neuroplasticity has just been discovered. And neuroplasticity could actually be a solution to what we are trying to accomplish here and now, making the blind see again. And I will get to that in a minute. But if you don't understand these disciplines, if you don't understand music at all, then you will probably not be able to appreciate, for instance, when an electronics engineer says there are harmonics in the line. What does harmonics mean? What does a digital age mean? Some of us think digital age just means, okay, there's a screen and there's digits on it, so it's a digital age. No, that's not what it means. But that's what we come to believe because we don't have any, any idea what this discipline is. It is, as a company leader, as an institutional leader, it is your responsibility to understand each major discipline, at least to its core level, where you can have a decent conversation about it, and where you can bring people together. So but I will get back to that in a minute. So now, we had everything working just fine. And then we go to screen number nine and eight, eight and nine. So if we can switch to eight, and then switch to nine, there you see me driving a car. And that's using the system. Now, it's in a controlled environment. No, I'm not like going 60 miles an hour or anything like that. I'm going about 20 kilometers an hour. I'm able to go to the end of a big building and make a T, uh, like a, a, a three-point turn, and come back. And I'm able to even avoid, there was, uh, it's not really shown in that picture, but there was um, a, a large transformer box made out of concrete on one end, and then there was a stairwell on the other that went down a few steps. So if I hit one of those two, I would have destroyed the car, but I didn't. And on top of that, Dr. Dobell at one point expected me to put his son, 10-year-old Martin Dobell, in with me for photo shoots while I'm driving. And he would say, faster, faster, do a burnout. So, yeah. So, but it was an exciting time. I was able to drive a car in a controlled environment using this system. So from here on, CNN took big pictures where I was actually on, the, on ABC, NBC. There's a lot of publicity still out there on this, and Dr. Dobell went through the trouble of, of paying a consultant in order to make sure that there were photos of this and that this was front page news. Because his financial model was that if he gets this working 
to the point where it was safe, it was able to be demonstrated, proof of concept, that now he would get enough blind people jumping on board because he could not work with the middleman. Let's look at Dr. Dobell's financial model for a second. Normally, if Ford brings out a car, for instance, they bring out a car and they've already got waiting people at their dealerships, hundreds of dealerships, where he can put the cars up for sale, if the Ford company can put cars up for sale. They don't just go out to the side of the road of their factory and say, for sale. No, they don't. When they have a new model of car, they already have a base, a middleman, where they can sell the cars. The middleman for a medical device, such as that of Bill Dobell, is the medical community. For instance, when a doctor sees you and says, ah, ah, you've got glaucoma, but don't fret, we have electronic eye implants from the Dobell Institute, we can put them in and then you can be able to see again if we cannot save your biological vision. So you're okay there, the medical community knows, but in order for the medical community to be in this picture, they would have to have, for instance, FDA and other regulatory approval. But how can FDA approve it if they don't know what it is and it hasn't had its test of time? FDA is there, after all, to protect you, the consumer, from being hurt by this and exploited by this. So it's a catch-22. So Dr. Dobell has to go around the FDA regulation, which in theory doesn't exist, even though there was a blanket uh, restriction on how much you can uh, stimulate the visual cortex of one volt, one amp, milliampere at the time, he needed up to 16 volts at times, and we went over 10 milliampere. So if you multiply the two, you'll end up with the, 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 the most we sometimes put to a person's brain was 160 fold in power, in watts, than was allowed by the FDA. But this is what we needed to do in order to see the visual image, the visual light sensation. So what could we do? We just had to go that way and we had to say to ourselves, well, the thing is FDA didn't say for a visual prosthesis is the maximum you can do because there was no visual prosthesis, so there was no regulation. It's kind of like trying to use the speed limit of a car in order to invent an airplane. It's not going to work. So we continued this. And we had the patients on side, and in the end, we had eight of us out of 15 able to see good. 15 of us were all able to see the phosphines, but the last three of the patients, really, we didn't get to put them to the test enough because what happened was, somewhere through the program, around 2003, we noticed Dr. Dobell getting sick, really sick. He was just having his own health crises. Partially because of the stress, I believe. Partially because it was just nearing the end of his life, which was very, very unfortunate. He was trying to accelerate the program for good reason, because there was only so much he had left. But while he was sick, he was looking for somebody who could take over. He was looking for somebody who had that transdisciplinary knowledge to be able to understand all the different facets because, you see, he had to bring together the different experts. We had five different expertise, at least, in it. We had the neurologist. The neurologist didn't know anything about electricity. We had the, electric, the electrical people that would, that would build those implants. But then we had to have the hardware designers. We had to have multiplexers. We had to have uh, power supplies regulated and um, variable power supplies. We had to have signal generators for the AC that would be able to be variated, etc. We had the computer team. And the computer team had to put together the hardware for the computers. And they had to work together with the ones that did the software. And then we had to have those who did the, the biocompatibility, the, the part of the, the chemistry. We had to have chemists on board who would understand that you could use these materials but not those materials because we had some biocompatibility issues and we had to resolve them. Then finally, we had to have the human psychologists in there too because that was a major part of the implementation process which we tried to shortcut at the time and that part didn't work. So we had these disciplines, and Dr. Dobell knew a little about each. He, he, he was impressive, actually. He was a biophysics doctor. He wasn't actually a, a medical doctor, so he couldn't have picked up a scalpel. But he was sharp in each one of these disciplines. Sharp, not to the point where he could build a shortwave radio the way I could, for instance, but he knew 
about, for instance, inductance. For instance, I asked him a question right off the bat. I said, so how are you going to avoid electrolysis on the, the, the mating point between the brain and the electrode? I mean, it's a saline solution. And so he gave me a, a, a good reason. He gave me a good answer, and he says he would always make sure that he had exactly the same positive as negative, and that if, if there was any sort of sign of electrolysis, he could increase one or the other because of the microprocessors a little bit more negative or a little bit more positive in order to reverse the electrolysis in order to keep the electrodes clear, etc. But he was looking for somebody to take over. In fact, there was a, uh, a university from Ohio that wanted to take over with a very lucrative financial offer to him, and he ended up refusing it, and he says to me, Jens, you know, the money's there, but they're just going to screw up the project because none of them really know artificial vision. Well, Dr. Dobell couldn't rightly put, I want an artificial vision expert in the newspaper for a, a job posting because they didn't exist. So it would be like the Wright brothers going out there canvassing for a good pilot. It wasn't going to work. He was on his own, and while he was looking for the right solution on this, he got very sick one day, and he just passed away unexpectedly because I had a, a decent conversation with him just prior to his death, and then suddenly he was gone. And when he was gone, there was really nobody that, wanted, that could take over because they would have to take over the risk. The risk would be the liability part. They would also have to take over the funding because the patients had already paid their $100,000, and that was spent. And we didn't have new patients in the queue yet because, well, we're going to get to that. There's a complex psychological reason for that. But in the end, the project stopped. And when the project stopped, I couldn't keep using the system because the system that we had was a prototype system. It had no adjustments on it. It had to be brought in to the lab to be readjusted from time to time every few weeks in order to maintain the right threshold levels. He was working on a system that was going to have all of this adjustable for the patient so that we wouldn't have to go back and forth anymore. But that time hadn't come yet. And now it was, it was over. So. We had to stop using the system. If you go to slide number 10, there it is. I had to have my implants taken out of the, like, just the jacks. Now, it, it, looks, it looks powerful, what you're seeing, but that is by far just a scratch compared to actually opening the brain. So the electrodes are still in my brain. The wires are still coming out through the top of my head, and they're just laying dormant underneath the scalp. So if... If by chance in the future we see um, some good company leaders out there who are transdisciplinary and are very creative, just maybe that I can reconnect some, some of those electrodes and be able to see again. So my sight now is no longer dependent on a miracle. My sight is now dependent on something that is out there. You see, to begin with, when I lost my sight between 83 and 2000, that time, 1983 and 2000, I knew I was blind for good because there was no solution. Now, in 2002 to 2004, I was able to see. And that solution's still there. We have that knowledge. That's why I wrote the book, just to make sure that that knowledge wouldn't disappear. I even put all of Dobell's letters in the book, carbon copied, so that we would know what happened and that this actually worked. And it's still all over the media. You can still see me driving the car at the American Society of Artificial Internal Organs, June 13th, Manhattan, on CNN. It's still there. So blindness is now an option. So let's go at what we've learned. OK, so now we've been making lots of notes. I just want to see how much time we have here. But I need about 10 minutes now to tell you what we've learned. First of all, logic. Logic is a major word when it comes to creativity. Because you see, logic comes with what we call laws. Think about the laws of gravity, the laws of relativity, Isaac Newton's laws, Ohm's law. The problem with a law is a law cannot be changed. If I break a law, I'm in trouble, so I've got to stay away from that. A law gives a starting point, but it also gives us an end point. So if it's a law to go up to 100 kilometers an hour on the road, you can go between 0 and 100, and that's it. Logic, however, should never be considered as a law in the creative context. 
Logic is open-ended, and it must remain open-ended. For instance, if we first are an infant and we throw a toy because we're very angry at our parents, so we throw a toy, we move our arm forward, we let go of it, and it lands in front of us. We know that. But now suppose we just use that logic and we try to throw something, we take this piece of paper here and we fold it differently, and next thing you know, it circles around us and lands behind us. Oh, what happened to our logic? Yes, it evolved. If there's a new set of conditions, now it's different. Now with the Dobell system, it's the same thing. We had logic thinking that we were going to develop the artificial vision system based on the logic of pixelated images on uh, devices such as our cell phones and, 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 and cameras and uh, where we just have a nice, neat group of pixels and we can pick and choose which ones we want. Well, we realized it wasn't so. Why? Because we can only perceive the first few dots that are in the middle, and then from there on, as we radiate out, our acuity becomes less and less, and then we don't really even need some of those dots out there. In fact, we don't even need half of them. Because if you have too many on the outside, you can't tell the one from the other. In fact, when we tried to ask the patient um, electrode number seven from electrode number eight, and they were all in the periphery, they wouldn't be able to tell us the difference between the two. And if they did, if they said this one is 25 centimeters away, this one's 28 centimeters away, we'd say, okay, great. And then we would mix them up. And the next thing you know, they would give us completely different figures. So obviously they didn't know, they couldn't see. And I myself, being a witness of this and having it, I can tell you this much. You can't use the same logic. The logic doesn't exist like that. It is actually completely different. First of all, you only see what's in the inside, and then as you move towards the outside, it becomes almost closer to a part consciousness, part sight. It's not exactly there anymore. And the, the best thing about this system is we found out there's such a thing as isomorphic um, fill in. Now this happens, for instance, this is, this is a term that doctors use, for instance, if you have an injury to your retina and part of your retina is ripped right out, but the other parts still work perfectly fine. You actually don't notice that part that's ripped out. Unless there's something particular you have to perceive there. If you look at a straight line, it will go a straight line through there because your, your association cortex, which is kind of a processing part of your brain that takes your image and processes it together with your other senses, including your decision-making sense, it processes it and next thing you know, it just fills it in so it looks like a straight line. So after seeing these for a little while, these images, next thing you know, I was able to make straight lines out of just three phosphines. Just three phosphines, and I was able to make a straight line out of it. I didn't see those black spots in between anymore. Then there was the, um, the idea that we would be able to put frames together. We didn't realize that, but we can put frames together in the working memory. If we had been able to accelerate, which we now easily will be able to do with the new quad-core processors, the frame speed to a full 24 per second, we wouldn't have those gaps in between. We'd be able to put 35 frames together and we would have an amazing, or at least based on my new lo logic, there might be a different hitch now, but we might have an amazing picture, even using only 100 electrodes. When Dr. Dobell was working on this system, there was a race. A race between him, and if you watch my uh, video that I have posted on, uh, from the Discovery Channel, you'll see Dr. Richard Norman from John Hopkins University was kind of like a rival with Dr. Dobell. They were working on the same kind of project, but from different perspectives, and uh, Dr. Norman was more into the penetrating electrodes, which at that time I wasn't so interested in. But, uh, he was also not doing human subject implantation. So Dobell was the first one out of the gate. The reporter asks Dobell, what do you think? First of all, he, he, he interviews Dobell, and then he goes to Dr. Richard Norman and says, what do you think about Dr. Dobell first having the visual prosthesis in place and functional? And Richard Norman says, it doesn't matter who's first. It matters who's best. So he was working on a thousand point implant, and so was Dr. Dobell, but he started with a 140 implant. Did we need those thousand electrodes? Maybe not. So if Dr. Richard Norman, for instance, says it doesn't matter who's first, it's who's best, in the meantime, the blind people stay blind. We can't forget about that one. Time doesn't stand still for me. I get older, my children grow up, they move out, they're no longer able to be seen, etc. and yet I'm still waiting for a visual prosthesis because it matters who's best. By the time you're best, maybe I'll already be six feet under. So it's really a, a catch-22 there. We're working on something that's super good, but at the same time, we're staying in total darkness. So the logic that we applied initially 
Now, part of the logic is how many electrodes should we implant? A thousand is better. The more, the merrier. Dr. Dobell tried, like I said, with the last three patients, to put 242 per side. So at first we had, what I had, 70 per side. Now he went to 242 per side, altogether 484. Yes, the patients saw them, but they suffered. Instead of healing the same time I did, within five to seven days, they were in for weeks, and they were fighting infection. They were finding, fighting all sorts of adverse side effects from all this excessive hardware in the head. In fact, what is generally the norm now accepted for a hermetically sealed implantation subdural is one cubic centimeter or less of material in total. Well, we had well over two and a half for my system. And for this system, it would have been somewhere around six or seven. So these patients were really not doing well. Now, when they did finally recover, we tried to fit them with a system. But just to go through the, go through the thresholding, to figure out how much each system, each electrode needed for voltage, took us weeks. Because you see, the patient was fatigued. The patient wasn't just a robot. The patient actually had fatigue. It was very difficult to suddenly see again after so many years. It was a powerful moment. It was a rewarding moment, but it was also very tiring very quickly. And then when we had to do the mapping, it was practically impossible. It was at the point where we realized if we went up to 1,000 or even 10,000 electrodes, we, would, we just wouldn't get done. Simple as that. We just wouldn't get done. So unless we had a better mapping technique, it would have been better just to stick with 100 electrodes and to be able to make the best of it with technology because this technology still had so much potential. I remember doing brainstorming with the engineers and we had decided we would do many different th um, things that are on it. For instance, gray area representation. We had none of that right now, but that could have been accomplished not by varying the voltages, which wouldn't work because you either see it or you don't, but if you varied, for instance, the the number of pulses. We used five pulses for each electrode. Four, I was able to read four because we experimented on me, and four would be more of a flash. Three would be just a blip, and two would be hardly able to be seen. So if we can use those four grades for something that's dark in the background, darker in the background, maybe use two, and then three for something that's lighter, and then for the stuff that's very light, for instance, the white colors, we would use the full five. That would have possibly worked. And that wouldn't have employed any sort of extra invasiveness or anything like that. So, and then we had this idea of doing magnification, where if, for instance, we make our eyebrows go down a little bit, it would activate a little lever switch, and that would double our magnification. We can't walk around with magnification because if we don't have the vision, the camera pixels exactly aligned with where we saw them in our visual field, degree by degree, we would either have um, magnification or a demagnification effect. And you know what happens when that, when you look in binoculars and you try to walk, the, if it's magnification, the image actually moves the opposite direction that your head is moving. And if it's demagnification, the image kind of follows you. So it becomes useless for, for instance, navigation. But if we want to look at something up close, we could just uh, make that little eyebrow switch go off. And next thing you know, we can read it close and then quickly go back to regular vision. So this is, uh, these are some of the inventions we had out there that, that we're just waiting to incorporate into the hardware, but then Dr. Dobell passed away. And the, uh, the idea of needing 1,000 phosphenes, that logic, it started to be questioned. Do we need 1,000? Do we need 10,000? But I had a meeting with this with Dr. Dobell once. I said, Dr. Dobell, why bother? Because he took me to the side in Portugal one day, and he says, Jens, I'd like to have that new implant. I didn't want it. It, was, it didn't look good. I already suffered with the small one enough. I didn't need the big one. It was too invasive. So I said, no, Bill, we don't need that. We don't really need it. He says, Jens, that's not the point, he says. He said, Jens, the point is, if I want insurance companies to take me seriously, anybody to take me seriously, I got to have what they want. And what they want right now is this. So, and they wanted that high phosphine count. Because now you had people who had no idea about artificial vision managing an insurance company, telling Dr. Dobell, no, it's got to be significant. Otherwise, we're not going to pay for it. It's not going to engulf a prosthesis. It's just something so that a blind person can see a bit of light and a few patterns. So what? They still have to use their white cane, so they really can't see. That was the mentality, you see. So the, the fourth part, or the, the, the final part about this, this program was the implementation 
of disruptive technology, which was super complicated. Going back to the logic, the logic changed, the logic evolved, and we had to have that open mind to evolve the logic and put in that new set of, I'm not, I'm not even going to say laws, because the next person who works on artificial vision should not look at what I've discovered as being a law, because it is still open for change, and you must always make sure whatever logic you have, it's open for evolution. Okay, so transplicit disciplinary, as I pointed out, the project in the end ceased to exist because Dr. Dobell could not find the person who was transdisciplinary enough to be able to, to, to bring together the expertise. This is super important. Even if you have only 50 words down pat of the very most uh, important parts or most relevant parts of a discipline and understand what they mean and understand what it means to involve yourself in this discipline and be able to have a a 15-minute conversation on this discipline. It is major in being able to bring together the various expertise. Because if you don't, then you have to hire somebody else. And when you have to hire somebody else to do that, they will ultimately take control of the program. Because there are ultimately going to be some transdisciplinary people out there. But as a company leader, you have to maintain control of your company, but at the same time, control of what happens in the R&D. You don't need to know how to implant people. You don't need to know how to um, use the scalpel and, and not be able to damage the brain taking off a tumor, no. But you need to know something. And so these things are very important. And the, the good thing about being transdisciplinary on the core level is that once you know the key language, you can spend five minutes with Professor Google, and next thing you know, you know the rest of the story. But if you don't know those words, you have no idea. I have a friend, for instance, who got a job. Um, he, he's an electronics engineer, fresh out of school, and then he got a job with a company that does uh, electri elect electron ir irradiation. And the, the boss says to him, okay, so um, anyways, you know what a klystrom is, right? And Nick, meanwhile, oh, oh, we didn't study that in school. Yeah, sir, uh, my phone's ringing. Hang on, let me just go back and get it. I'll be right back there. Quickly go over in a corner and see what is a klystrom. But because you know all of that industry-specific language, in two, two minutes you can see, oh, that's what a klystrom is. Okay, great. And then you're back to the conversation with the boss and you know exactly what you're talking about. And this is what you need to be able to do this. For instance, I know French, but I don't know French so well. But if you give me a French dictionary, I can look up the next word. Why? Because I already know those other words that are written in the dictionary to describe the word I'm looking for. So transdisciplinary model of education, it's, it's part of a responsibility to go along with your expertise. Um, and, and that is ultimately what this project depended on in order to move forward. So now we're getting to the hardest part of the whole project, and that was introducing disruptive technology to society as a whole. Social acceptance of disruptive technology is, it's, it's already a difficult, it's already a difficult subject to deal with. We don't like change. I mean, if I tell you right now, I hear somebody yawning. If I don't, for instance, it, implement a change, everybody will be very happy. If the professor says, yeah, you, you just do everything you do every day, and then eventually you graduate, you're OK. But that's not going to help you. Now, on, the, on another level, change can help other people. It can hinder other people, depending on what it is. We have, for instance, the automobile coming in and, and, and the horse is being kicked out, but now when we start changing from the automobile to another level, there are gonna be some people who are in the oil industry that might not be so happy. So we, we always have certain people who are against change, but the rest of us, whether we're against it or not, we're a little bit timid about it because we're not sure what to expect. One of the biggest problems with this system is that it was a change for the minority sector, the marginalized sector population. So nobody really thought it was a big necessity to invest in it. So you didn't get, for instance, the elite first investing in it, and then it trickled down to the working class, and then from there on it trickled down to the, to the marginalized sector. The, the impoverished people were able to maybe afford it here and there. You didn't get that. You just got the blind population, about 40 million of us, having working visual cortices, um, but at the same time not being able to see who would be interested in this. Like I say, I was holding 1,000, as a patient representative, I was holding over 10,000 inquiries. 
and there were more on the phone, but these were email inquiries, and 16 people showed up for implants. Why? Did they really want to just stay blind, all the others? We started to look into this a little bit closer. First thing we noticed was, to our astonishment, family members were starting to question, why do you need to see? Okay. When I came to the Dobell Institute first, it was in Portugal, just to get my psychiatric exam to see if I was ready or not for, for such a risky operation, there were, I heard a bunch of crying, and I was thinking to my, I was saying to my wife, oh no, this doesn't sound good. Somebody, I guess, didn't pass the psychiatric exam, and he wasn't allowed to do the, 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 the implant. Because I was really terrified that I would be rejected, so I was reciting, what am I going to say? Oh, it's wonderful. I want to get this operation. No, I like pain. No, no, that isn't going to sound good. So I was trying to recite, what am I going to say to the psychiatrist to make sure she's going to pass me so I can go on with the next stage of this? Meanwhile, these people are crying. So when it came my turn for the interview, I said to the psychiatrist, so well, what happened there? And she says, no, no, what happened was the guy came, he's, he's you know, the, the patient came, he's perfectly capable, he's, he's a good candidate, everything, he wants it. He's a, like in his 40s, but his wife and his child, they are terrified. So the family is not ready for this, and uh, he decided he would just not go through with the operation. Now imagine that. What happened there? On a second case, just recently I was with the Neuro Neurological Institute of Netherlands, and we had Netherlands Institute of Neurology, pardon me, and we had a bit of a little meeting, and a guy that had a operation, a patient from the Argus II, which is from Second Side Medical Products. It, it's about the same kind of technology, similar, but it is for people with retinitis, retinitis pigmentosis where eight of the nine layers of the retina still function, but the top one doesn't function anymore. Typical for, for instance, um, uh, older people get this problem, but sometimes younger people get it too. So he had this implant. It, it doesn't even, it didn't cost him the money that, for instance, the Dobell one did, et cetera. But he, he said, he said that the, the biggest hurdle for him was that when his turn came, he was accepted by Second Sight to get this implant, but his family was asking him, why do you want it? Everything's going fine in your life. So he's been blind since 15, he started losing his sight. So his family knew him when he could see, then he was blind for about 10 years before he had this chance, and now his family was questioning him. So I try to think about this from the context of a social worker, and I'm, I'm at the point now where I realize that for a person with a long-term disability to change back to not having that disability, it's almost like, a, like an identity reassignment procedure for them. Because they have to convince the others around them, no, I don't need to be the blind person anymore, I can actually be the sighted person again. And not everybody wants to go through that process. A lot of people are sensitive to their family's feelings and they just leave the issue alone. Why would I stress them over getting this money together so that uh, just so I can annoy them and now be not that person that they expect me to be? Does it sound fantastic? If you just think right now, you are all, you are all I'm assuming, able to see me. If you lose your sight tomorrow and your parents find out or your, your grandparents or your, your, your loved ones, whatever, you, they will say, no, this is not acceptable. We need to change that. And if something is available for $100,000, perhaps they will pitch in. But if now this was you, for the last 10 years not being able to see, you're here, you're accepted as a person with a handicap and everything's in place, you have a computer with screen reader, everything's under control, you have a future, people might just say, no, you don't need that. You're doing fine. But you're still in the dark. That isn't going to change. Regardless of how good your job is in the future, how many children you have, what they look like, you never know, because you are in the dark. And this is sometimes forgotten by our support team. So what we needed to do in order to prevent this is to have this contingency plan for that final step of implementing disruptive technology. If we don't have that contingency plan, which can be up to 50% of the cost of the whole project. Normally a contingency is somewhere between 10 and 15%, but when it comes to this kind of disruptive technology implementation, you better be prepared to do one of two of two things. One of them is to spend more money in personnel to, de to sensitize, for instance, the micro-communities within the recipients. 
For instance, the families of people who are blind need a social worker in order to come and explain to them how it really is for these people who are blind to be blind. I mean, never mind the fact you can just close your eyes and say it's not fun, but that's not good enough. Sometimes they say, no, no, he's doing fine. He's, he's always there. He doesn't see blindness the way I see blindness. And quite frankly speaking, I can't blame people for thinking that way because when I first lost my sight, I thought, you know, it can't be that a person exists in the darkness all the time. They must find a different way to see and then suddenly they'll see and it'll be fine. So this, this is one of the contingencies you have to deal with, is the implementation. And it might actually take a little bit longer in order to be able to see fruition of your product in the end. Now, speaking of that, I'd like to switch to slide number 11. This is a completely new concept. Slide number 11 is, you see me there with um, these funny glasses. Now those glasses, you can buy them off eBay, really? They're called augmented reality. Some of you probably know all about this. They have little screens in the middle, but they also have earphones, and they have a microprocessor. And on this, there is loaded the VOIC, the voice. And this is a um, doctor from, not a medical doctor, an engineer, actually, from Amsterdam, Dr. Peter Meyer. He's from Eindhoven, pardon me. And he is, um, right now, for free, he is allowing blind people to use his product, which basically makes sounds that are exactly um, congruent with the image out there. So for instance, if there's a line that goes across, it'll make a straight frequency. If it goes up like this, the frequency goes up. If it's down like this, the frequency goes down. If it's higher like this, it goes down from a higher scale to a not so low scale, etc. And it scans from left to right once a second. You can adjust how often it does it. And it provides these consistent patterns with what is out there. So right now I can immediately tell you when there's a circle, when there is a, uh, um, a straight line, when there's a crooked line, when there's a triangle, I can do that. I'm not so good at yet being able to tell complex images, but the potential here is super. If we go to video one and then play video two, you can see me in one video picking up a, uh, just uh, by just reaching down, seeing my white cane, picking it up. And in the other one, I'm actually walking around a little bit. In, in, it's in a complex place. I'm looking for a bench, so I'm turning a few circles in the first time to disorient myself, and then using the glasses to orient ah, myself. Learn to see through sensory substitution. Now, now why am I reading that? That's a good because thing to do. It actually has OCR right involved in it. So I'm able to read with OCR. When you see the letters, it'll actually read the letters out to me. So it's, it's really uh, neat. It, it does both at the same time. And it has a lot of potential because I can increase or w like work together with the engineer to change the software in order to adjust to exactly what I want. So the, the interesting part about this whole um, new technology is that it's completely non-invasive and it uses what's called neuroplasticity. It allows us to see using our auditory sense. Now there's something really interesting about this whole concept because people who are born blind, they are the only ones that can, the, the people who are born blind will never be able to use, for instance, a, uh, from what we know right now from our existing logic, existing logic only, um, those Dobell implants because we tried implanting somebody who was six years old and somebody who was three, year old, three years old when they lost their sight, now adult, and they weren't able to see the sensations. However, these glasses you can even use when you're congenitally blind. So it is, it is great, but it does use sound. However, some of the congenitally blind people who are using these systems, because we have a big support um, group on the internet, are reporting that they actually see the images. Now, whether or not they see the images, I can't prove. But if they say they see the images, that's already good enough. Because if that's their way of sight, it's the way it goes. For instance, after a while, when you're blind and you feel something, you make an image out of it immediately if it's a simple project. So now you're actually able to hear something that's a distance away and you can interact with it whereas before you couldn't. Now, one of our patients, when we did the Dobell implantation, his name was Dennis, he was 18 when he lost his sight in a car accident, he was 22 when he was implanted. At first he was able to see the dots just like me when we set him up. Then, at some point we wanted to switch him over to the frames and he says, Stop that, stop that, those beeps. I can't stand those beeps. And I was standing right beside him and there was nothing. I didn't hear anything. None of us heard anything. 
he was actually making an auditory sense out of the visual information that was being brought in through those, through those um, faucets, through the electrodes that were supposed to turn into visual images for him. Later on, after we, we gave him some rest, we figured he was tired, we brought him back, and then he was able to see the phosphenes. So now, because he had that sound crossover, does it perhaps suggest, and this is just, just me talking as a, as a person who's blind and wants to see desperately, does it mean that neuroplasticity can be expanded to the point where this technology might actually, with the help of a very intensive therapeutic intervention turn into a device that can truly provide visual sensations and sight, provided that we have the right support behind it. Because so far, the inventor of this, Dr. Meyer, he's the only one who's putting his, his, his time and money into it, and he has to do his day job too. So the amount of time he can put into it is limited. And of course, the patient training is all left up to us to do on our own. So this is where creativity and technology intersect, and they have an unlimited potential, provided you leave your logic open-ended, provided you know all d important disciplines to the point where you can say you are interdiscipline literate, and provided that you understand the complexity of human sociology when you want to implement this technology into the mainstream. And I will leave everything open for you for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your, your presentation. Um, amazing first-hand experience uh, about transdisciplinarity, about creativity, and so on. We have a few minutes for a question. If some of you wants to ask a question to Jens Noman. Uh. Thank you for the presentation. That was very interesting. I just wanted to ask if you can still dream images in your dream, or what your dreams are like. Well. Dreams are an interesting thing, especially after you lose your sight, you realize sometimes you dream as if it's real because, but then when you're dreaming as a real person, you're dreaming in that time frame. So when you dream later on, then I dream in a way that I'm able to see only what my other senses are perceiving. So I'll be able to see a person, for instance, because I imagine a person before me when you speak, but I won't see your face. So the dreams change according to the time. However, if I go back and have a dream when I was a boy, then I'm seeing everything the way it was. We have another question on your left, Jens. Uh, hello, uh, th thank you for your oh. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. Uh, I had two questions actually. First one is more technical. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I understood the way phosphenes work and how they interact with uh, well real life objects. Does phosphenes? Well, or stimulated by the when you're presented with an object, or not sure how it worked. And um, second one was more about what you said about the well interdisciplinary logic. What advice would you have for business school students who don't really have a technical education? Uh, how are we supposed to be well edu educating ourselves to be able to well engage with more technical topics, as you said, and be able to well translate from different field works? I understand both questions and they are, the first one is easy, the second one requires a more work. Um, not to answer, but on your part. So the first one is the phosphenes constitute a light that you see somewhere in your visual field, always in the same spot. For instance, suppose I'm always seeing light from electrode number 17 when it is given three volts at um, 50 hertz. And I'm always seeing it there. So now we are matching it with a pixel block on the camera. Now, it, it could be just a single pixel, but because cameras have a much higher acuity, they have you know, millions of pixels, we block them into blocks of 64 so that if something is seen there that is light, for instance, it will then provoke the computer, instruct the computer to send the signal to the multiplexer, which will then single out electrode number 17, and electrode number 17 is going to get that phosphine lighting up. 
So that's how it works in general. That's how the vision works. When things are light, they are given phosphines. Now, of course, you can change that, and we changed that later because we had problems seeing dark on dark, so we started looking using edge detection software, which then, first the, cam the, the whole camera image would be scanned by the computer, and then the edges of what we were looking at, for instance, the edge of the podium here, the edge of the stage, would be then displayed by phosphenes. So that was slowed down from 10 frames a second to 7 frames a second, but it gave us a lot better um, uh, useful vision. But that's basically how it works. Now, the second one, about transdisciplinary education. It is up to you to, f to find someone who is able to give you the hardcore crash course on a single discipline. There are ways to do that. For instance, when I went to learn my French, I learned the first 500 words. And from there on, I was able to listen to the radio and move forward and get to the point where I'm nearly fluent. But if I didn't have those first 500 words, I was out of luck. You have to find those first, and it's not, it won't be 500 words, it will be more like between 30 and 50. Industry specific language that pertains to that particular discipline. For instance, in electricity, it would be Ohm's law. Or the entities, for instance, current, volts, watts, ohms, resistance, inductance. How do these fit together and what do they mean? Then to get some on hands-on training, especially for the practical ones, build a few circuits. Build the circuit of a light going on and off. Build a circuit of three lights in parallel versus three incandescent lights in series and just see what happens. Things that a lot of children do when they play in that industry, but you might have not had the chance. You might have had distant, different interests at the time of your childhood. So, but the, you, you will then have to do that to, to all. For instance, learning an instrument, just learn the, the very basics of a guitar. You'll notice, for instance, on a guitar, you have three major chords. You C, F, and G for the C major chord. You're, you're basically your one, four, and five chords. How do they fit together and why? What does harmony mean? And once you know that, you'll be able to play any instrument provided you develop the skill. It doesn't mean you have to hammer out scales over and over and over again just to learn that particular instrument. You just need to learn the concept and be comfortable with it. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very educational. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering for all these very long researches, mm -hmm. who pays for it? Because it's international concern. Is it governments or... Uh, non-governmental organizations or the patients themselves? Interestingly enough, Dr. Dobell was using only the patients and his own money out of his own pocket, and he was the one able to make the blind people see first. We have various organizations, even the one that, for instance, John Hopkins was working on at the time Dobell was working, that are graciously funded by the funding agencies, but the funding agencies have criteria. And this is what Dr. Dobell explained to me. If I go through a funding agency, I have to work by their rules, and their rule says no human subject implantations. And to date, we don't have any human subject implantations. There is, for instance, Monash University in, 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 in Australia. From my understanding, they are stuck on the animal testing one. They, they, they can't even get that okay yet. Um, we, we have different criteria that when the funders are involved, they have their criteria and you have to work under their rules. So the funding does come, but the implantations to the human subjects doesn't. And the human subjects don't have a choice then but to stay blind. So you can go to a one way or another. Dr. Dobell's financial model was to go straight from his own pocketbook to that of the patients and then prove it, and then that way there's enough pressure for FDA to change, because now, because FDA does need evidence that they can change their rules. They, they can't just change them. They are, after all, supposed to keep you protected. And then from there on, he would be able to get the insurance companies on his side and the medical agencies in order to be able to promote his product from there. So he was working from 
his side all the way to the end user product and then to get the middlemen on side in the meantime. But the other agencies, they basically work from the first part with the research and then they apply for grants, but the grants, when they get a grant, they are still not allowed to do the human subject implantations. So that's why it's kind of stuck. We have some very good institutions out there right now working on this technology, but it is still in that stage where people are still remaining blind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jens, again. Thank you for being with us today for this inspiring lecture. Thank you very much.